On this week's episode, we're headed into the crypt for um, some tales, I guess, because it's... Don't you dare say that. That's my line. Tales from the crypt. Oh my, oh my god, it's, it's the crypt keeper. Um, what are you even doing here? Well, you see, this channel stinks, so I assumed it was rotting, and I was just naturally attracted. Then how would you like to uh, stick around and help me figure out this timeline? No. Despite what it may look like, I actually have a life. <laughs> the saga of the crypt actually started back in 1950 with the EC Comics Anthology series entitled Tales from the Crypt, which was part of a series of similar books like Haunt of Fear and Vault of Horror. The Crypt Keeper, the host was a hermit type guy with a robe and long white hair that covered his face frequently. This series lasted for several years before the public backlash to horror comics created by Frederick Wortham's book The Seduction of the Innocent and the Comics Code was created which basically wouldn't allow, well, anything that would normally appear in a horror comic so it folded in 1954. Later, in 1972, a new life was given to the property with a film version called simply Tales from the Crypt, a part of the classic Amicus Anthology series. It kicks off with five people on a tour of some catacombs who get lost and end up in a room with the Supreme Being, or I guess the Crypt Keeper, who tells them all stories. The first one involves Joan Collins, who kills her husband on Christmas, and this newspaper tells us that it's, oh, September of 1971? Not Christmas? Guess he's behind on his news rating. Anyway, it's 1971, and a maniac dressed as Santa is stalking Alexis Carrington, only to have her daughter let him into the house to kill her. The second story follows Carl, who leaves his family to run off with his secretary only to get into a car wreck, but when he returns home, he finds out that it's two years later, and he's a zombie. But that was just a dream until the wreck happens again. It presumably takes place in 71 also, since he's dead at the same time as Joni. And the third tale follows James here, who lives with his dad and hates his neighbor, the elderly Grimsdyke, played by the always phenomenal Peter Cushing, and they continually make his life miserable, ruining his reputation and career, and they say that it's two weeks away from Valentine's Day, not around Christmas, so this isn't the same time frame as the Christmas story, but possibly from earlier the same year. Or a little later in February of 72. Grimsy kills himself and a year passes and his gravestone reads 1972. So that's when our main story is set, but this ending part is actually in 1973. So it's pretty clear that the stories aren't all at the same time then. And zombie Arthur rises to get his revenge. The fourth is about Ralph, who's a businessman going broke who ends up with a wishing statue, and his wife wishes for money, and before you can say monkey's paw, the insurance policy makes it happen. When she wishes him alive again, she forgets that he's already been embalmed, and has to chop him up to kill him again. But, because her wish was for him to live forever, she could chop him up all she wants, and he'll still be alive. There's no date in this segment, but it's around the same time as the others, most likely 72 or so, and we go to our final entry about Major Rogers, who takes over a home for the blind and immediately starts pinching pennies, making everyone miserable, and when his negligence causes one of them to die, they lock him in a room and then force him through a narrow hallway, like just lined with razor blades, and then turn off the lights, which is some jigsaw level shenanigans right there. 
no date again, so 72 again, and they end with the revelation that they're all on their way to hell and already dead. And, um, you know, hey, I, I've got to point out that that's kind of a little bit weird because Ralph's wife wished for him to live forever, so even after she chopped him up, he was still alive, so how could he be in the afterlife if, if she wished for him to always be alive? I got you, Crypt Keeper. I got you. Don't blame me. Blame the guy from Dr. Zhivago. Interesting to note that three of these entries, and All Through the House, Blind Alleys, and Wish You Were Here, were all redone for the later TV series, although, although changed uh, quite a bit. One year later, a sequel arrived with 1973's The Vault of Horror, also based on the comics of the same name, although curiously, none of the stories featured within this movie appeared in the Vault of Horror comic, and mostly were adapted from comics and tales from the crypt. This one again features a group of strangers, but this time an elevator takes them to an upscale room where they talk about nightmares. The first is Harold, who tracks his sister down in order to kill her for an inheritance, only to discover the whole town is full of vampires, including Dear Sis, and ends up on tap. And look, look at these fangs. How do you manage to not just bite your lips, like, all the time? Next up is Arthur, an extremely fastidious man whose particulars drive his wife crazy to the point that she kills him with a hammer and, and puts him in jars and, and hmm, I... I wonder what the odds and ends are. Our third story is about Sebastian on a trip to India who claims to be a magician and then just ruins another guy's performance by revealing how the trick is done. The Alliance of Magicians is going to hear about this. There's a poster on the wall for a movie called Anita, which came out in 1967, so we're at least past that. And in order to obtain an unusual trick, Sebastian kills this woman, but her rope trick has other ideas. Next up is Maitland, who is buried alive as part of an insurance scheme, and there's a copy of the Tales from the Crypt novelization here, which came out in 1972, so we're sometime around that time frame, and due to a misunderstanding, when being dug up, is killed by the gravedigger. The final story gives us the one true doctor as an artist in Haiti, and he goes to a voodoo priest in order to gain the ability to get revenge on the art dealers who wronged him. If he draws an image and then destroys it, the effects bleed into the real world, so he makes paintings of his enemies and mutilates them, including Marcus Brody, and his desk calendar finally gives us a date of January 1972. Moore gets a taste of his own medicine, though, and of course we discover that they're all already dead, but instead of being in hell, they're in a graveyard, forced to retell their stories every night for all eternity. I just want to stress, though, that everyone in this one either killed someone or was involved in crime, except for Arthur, whose sin that required eternal torment to atone for was, um, being tidy to the point of annoyingness. The franchise went away for a little while until it finally resurfaced in 1989 with the HBO series simply called Tales from the Crypt, which catapulted the property into being a household name. It ran for seven seasons and featured a who's who of top level actors and directors, plus introduced a new take on the Crypt Keeper, here an animatronic designed by Kevin Yeager and voiced by John Cassier that would go on to become the most iconic addition to the series. The TV show became popular enough that eventually it led to a return to the silver screen with 1995's Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight. It wasn't a story from the comic, but was a script that had been bounced around the studios for several years, at one point landing in Full Moon's hands, who didn't make the film due to budget reasons, and eventually landed at Universal with the intention of being the second of the Crypt films. But it was bumped up instead to being the inaugural entry. Directed by Ernest Dickerson, it starts with the Crypt Keeper on a movie set with Dan Fielding introducing his new movie that features the Grim Reaper on the run, and he ends up in a small town 
with Walter Paisley, and he's being chased by Slam Evil, and ends up at a hotel with the amazingly named CCH Pounder, and the future Mrs. Smith, as well as Roger Rabbit, and Flint Marco. Seems the collector here is looking for this thing, an ancient key filled with blood, and he quickly reveals his true colors, and the key can hurt him. He calls up these baby pumpkin head looking things that can be killed by destroying their eyes, and blood from the key can seal off doorways so that they can't enter. And the collector can also tempt you into allowing him to take you over, turning you into a phenomenal practical creature effect. And we find out that the breaker is older than he appears, and he has been around since World War I in 1917. And the key contains the blood of Jesus, and if the collector gets it, he'll bring about the end of the world. Eventually, their numbers get whittled down one by one, including the, the little kid character, until only Breaker and Geraldine are left, but Breaker is mortally wounded, so he makes Jerry the new Did somebody say Jerry? The new demon knight and then dies, leaving her to fight the collector on her own. She gets the upper hand, spitting the blood in his face, which reveals his true form, and then destroys him. So she gets a refill and moves on. But it's clear that her mission has just begun. The very end here shows us a license plate that expires in November of 94. So that's probably when we're set. And the very, very, very end of the film gives us a stinger in which the Crypt Keeper promises the next entry called Dead Easy. So, Dead Easy was supposed to be a zombie film set in New Orleans, but that one never happened, and instead, the following year saw 1996's Bordello of Blood, which kicks off with Phil Fondacaro in Mexico, and he revives Lilith, the mother of the vampires. And the key is back, but I, th I think it's a different item here, not connected to the previous film. Although, Demon Knight did say that there were seven of them, so, uh, possibly? Here, it's specifically a ward against vampires, and we get our Crypt Keeper intro with a mummy, played by a returning William Sadler, and we then meet a Baywatch lifeguard, and the internationally acclaimed musician, Corey Feldman, who has a Demon Knight poster on his wall, which places us in a different continuity from that one, and since it came out in 95, we're set after that then. Tommy Jarvis and friends head to a bordello run by Lilith, who's played by Angie Everhart, and she kills the crew. Dennis Miller appears, and interestingly enough, almost didn't, since both the writer slash producer and director had decided on Daniel Baldwin and Robin Givens as Rafe and Lilith, and yet executive producer Joel Silver insisted on Angie Everhart and Miller in the roles, creating a bit of friction, especially since Miller apparently was extremely difficult on set. Miller is a PI hired by Caleb's sister, and she works for an evangelist who knows a thing or two about vampires, and he's working with Lilith to kill sinners. And things escalate with Corey's vamp, which would make the Frog Brothers pissed. And then there's a weird Whoopi Goldberg cameo, like why is this the type of movie in which you get a random celebrity cameo? Phil gets shot, and this is the second timeline recently in which Phil plays a character who's swayed to the dark side to work with demonic forces and gets killed by a random gumshot. Rafe and the Rev team up with Holy Water Super Soakers in a, in a pretty spectacular scene, and Corey goes down... JC gets stabbed, and then they have a final fight with Lilith in which Rafe uses the, um, uh, the laser light of the Lord to cut Lilith's heart into four pieces, and Catherine kills her. But then it's revealed that she was actually turned earlier in the film and is a vampire, which uh, doesn't really make a ton of sense with her helping the humans. I mean, I, I, I guess she was looking to take over the queen spot, I, I guess? We end with more Crypt Keeper, and there was no date visible in this one, but real time works, so let's roll with 96. 
Well, the film was a dud at the box office, and even though it only cost about 2.5 million to make, it only grossed 5 million at the theaters, and although that was a profit, it was a huge drop from Demon Knight's 20 million take, and was torn apart by critics and audiences, so any further plans for the series were dropped in terms of theatrical runs. But, oddly enough, the series did kinda continue. In 2002, Tales from the Crypt Ritual started running overseas, although the film was not conceived as a crypt movie. It was a standalone film that was intended as a sort of a remake of I Walked with a Zombie, and a quick intro and end scene were slapped on it to bring it into the franchise. So, even though the previous two were scripts that were modified to be in the series, this is the first that an entirely complete film was co-opted. The puppet for the intro, a Rasta Crypt Keeper, is an obvious big step down in terms of effects. This thing is terrible. I'm, I'm embarrassed for even watching it. That's clearly not me. It's like when Gallagher's brother tried to Taurus him. Talk about a dead ringer. It starts with OG Pennywise, discount David Boreanaz, and there's voodoo shenanigans going on. And then we're introduced to Dr. Baby, and Bing, Ned the Head, and this letter lets us know that we're set in May of 2000, and Alice's license is revoked, so she takes a job in Jamaica, working for Cabal to figure out what's wrong with his brother. Wesley's files also say that it's 2000, and voodoo hoodoo happens, including some sketchy, very sketchy CGI and deaths, including Wadsworth, and it turns out that Paul and Caro are behind the whole thing. And there's treachery, and Alice gets the upper hand and rescues Wesley, and then marries him, with the Crap Keeper showing up again after the credits. And seriously, I refuse to accept this as the actual Keeper. How embarrassing. Even his puns suck. That was the end of the films, and the show had been off the air since the time of Bordello of Blood, and there hasn't been any Keeper appearances since. Quick note that both From Dust Till Dawn and The Frighteners were both considered to be entries in the series at one point. There were other TV spin-offs of the show, at least, with a Tales from the Crypt cartoon series, of all things, that went for two seasons, and a weird kids game show called Secrets of the Crypt Keeper's Haunted House that lasted two years as well. There was also a radio series and a, a spin-off show called Perversions of Science that only ran for one month. Although there hasn't been any movie news, there was a potential reboot of the show that would have run on TNT that wouldn't feature the Crypt Keeper, but was finally discarded because of legal rights issues. So there you have it, five movies. Two distinct series and clearly no continuity between them. They're anthologies, of course, so definitely not connected, except for the appearance of the Crypt Keeper, and even that uh, doesn't have a sound continuity. I only take credit for two of those appearances. The rest are charlatans. <laughs> That's true, and these are all watchable. It's very, very fun stuff. The classic Tales and Vault are great and should be watched, like, immediately. Demon Knight is fantastic and just such an all-around awesome movie. Um, Bordello, yeah, Bordello's okay, I like it, it and Ritual's pretty skippable. If you're going for completing the series, it's not gonna make you upset because it's not terrible or anything, but it's it's pretty boring. But but uh, hey, it was, it, was, it was good to see you, CK. Well, it was good to see you again, and you viewers too. I hope you enjoyed seeing me, your old pal, the Crypt Keeper. I'm sorry I don't have better puns. Sometimes they're hard to make. Well, that about says it, and tell us what you think down below, and make sure that you click that like button and stuff like that, subscribe to the channel, because you know that you want to. And of course, check out the patrons, because my Patreon page is patreon.com slash movie timelines, and these guys went there, and they help support the channel. You can do that as well, and help keep these videos being made, but you can also do that just by watching the videos. So keep on doing that, and I'll see you very shortly for another great one. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.